Hello all, happy new year. And today we'll be discussing orbital cellulitis. So you see a patient who's coming with you know, swelling of the eyes like this. And they are telling my child has had some cough and cold last one week. Fever has been there on and off, but now fever is just high grade and this eye swelling has been there for two days. So you need to think of two things. Is it preceptal cellulitis? Is it orbital cellulitis? But before we go to that, we need to know how does eye infection happen? I mean, we are talking about some cough and cold history, correct? So generally, it's an extension from the surrounding sinuses. So if you look at this picture, it's like a cut section. So I am cut like this and you're seeing me from the side. So what are you seeing? You're seeing the frontal sinus here, correct? And this is the space where orbit is going to lie. Okay, behind the orbit, you are having a thin plate of bone that is the lamina papyracea. Okay, papyracea means like paper. It's a very thin sheet of bone. Then beneath that, you are having a maxillary sinus. And behind and above, you are having the sphenoid sinus. So basically, this orbit is sitting surrounded by sinuses on multiple layers. And you are having a very thin bone between the ethmoid sinus and your orbit. And if you see, there are small, small, small holes, correct? Multiple small holes are there. So these are all natural foramina which are present. These are called as Zucker candles dehiscence. And you are having multiple veins that are going between the orbit and your sinuses. And these veins are valveless, which means it allows veins, I uh, mean vein, blood to move both forward and backward. So bidirectional flow is there. Because of these three reasons where your orbit is surrounded by sinuses on multiple sides, you are having veins which are having bidirectional flow and you are having multiple holes in your space between your orbit and your sinus. These three reasons, Nala, you have easy spread of infection from sinus to eye. Okay. Usually sinusitis is the preceding thing which happens before uh, orbital cellulitis happens. So roots of spread, like we discussed, usually it is from the sinus. Okay, it's a direct extension or a contiguous spread. Or it can be an infection that is in the eye. Maybe a trauma, maybe a surgery has happened and then it is just extending. Or you are having a bloodstream infection and it is seeding in the eye. Okay, so that is a hematogenous spread. So eye infection going further deep directly from the eye. Extension or contiguous spread from the surrounding area can be the sinus or a hematogenous spread. These are the three ways in which this eye swelling and eye infection that we are seeing in this child can occur. Correct? So the history you will ask will directly correlate to that. So you will ask if there has been a trauma, some foreign body fell into the eye, if there has been a recent surgery or if there has been a cough and cold in this child recently, any eye discharge which was treated but was not treated completely or has this child been unwell generally in the past few days. So these things will tell you what could be the possible source. Now you need to know whether it is preceptal or orbital cellulitis. So what is the anatomical distinction that you have? See, this is again like a cut section of the eye. So if you see your skin, subcutaneous tissue, muscle, other than forget. Beneath that, you are having an orbital septum. Correct? You are having an orbital septum up and down. In between, you have the eye. And you are having muscle layer, correct? And you are having the fat. So any infection that is in front of this orbital septum is called as preceptal cellulitis. Anything that is behind this orbital septum is called as orbital cellulitis. And remember, even though we call it as orbital cellulitis, infection does not touch the globe. Okay, it will involve the fat, it can involve the muscle, but it does not actually touch the globe. So, depending upon the extent of infection, this Chandler person has modified a pre-existing classification. So, you are having five stages. Five, uh, yes, five stages to it. The first one is your preceptal cellulitis. Okay, so in front of the orbital septum, in front of this septum, you are having inflammation. Stage two is orbital cellulitis, where it is posterior to the septum. Very simple. Stage 3 is there is an abscess formation beneath the periosteum of lamina papyracea. 
lamina papyracea is what we discussed here. Okay, between ethmoid sinus and your orbit. Stage 4 is where you are having orbital cellulitis and there is generalized purlal collection in whole of your orbital cavity. It's not just in one area. Okay, stage 5 is where it has extended behind into the cavernous sinus. Okay, so these are your 5 stages of your Chandler's classification. And this diagram I felt was very easy to remember. Okay, so why do you need to know these stages and how will you know it clinically? So that is the next question. It is important to differentiate between preceptal and orbital cellulitis. So this is a table that is available in up to date. Okay, you can go through this. But for all practical purposes, for you to differentiate, these four points are extremely important. When the child is coming like this, you will ask, how did this happen? Now you want to know the extent of infection. How are you going to ask? You will look for painful eye movement or there is no movement in your eye at all. Child is not able to move. There is palsy or the eye is popping out or there is significant chemosis or you are seeing this child is not able to see. There is visual disturbance or you are seeing abnormal pupillary reaction or RAPD. Okay. If these are there, then it points more towards orbital cellulitis. Okay, so if these four are not satisfied, all the four are absent, then it is preceptal cellulitis. Okay, why are you worried about orbital cellulitis? Because chances of complications are more. Where you are telling abscess is going to form, where you are telling whole orbit can fill with access, there can be intracranial extension, then that is more of orbital cellulitis. Preceptal cellulitis will not have it. Okay, so that's why it's important for you to differentiate. Plus preceptal cellulitis, you can get away with oral antibiotics. Whereas orbital cellulitis, always treat the patient as an inpatient admission with IV antibiotic. Okay, because it is vision and life threaten. So now if you have a patient with that red eye that we saw first, with any of these, okay, some painful eye movement is there, some blurring of vision is there, eye is popping out, chemosis is there. Or eye is so tightly shut that you are not able to see what is inside. You are not able to examine eye movement, you, know, you imagine. Okay, you are not able to examine pupillary reaction. Child is not able to open eye to tell whether there is visual disturbance or not. Then it could be orbital cellulitis, you do not know. So at that time, you definitely need to get a contrast enhanced CT. Remember, plain CT can pick up hemorrhages. It cannot pick up infection. So you need to give contrast if you are looking for an infection. This holds true for any infection site. So when you do a CT, you need to ensure and you need to write in your radiology investigation that you are looking for orbit. You are looking at the sinuses also because you need to know if something is extending. Correct? And you need to have a cut of the brain that is just immediately next to your orbit. Okay? Because there can be intracranial extension. Okay? So now we saw these four points. Correct? So why will these four points occur? Painful eye movements can occur if there is muscle involvement. Okay. If there is significant muscle edema, if there is significant edema of the fat, then your whole eye will get pushed forward. All right. And why will visual disturbance occur? Why will a vision loss occur? One, direct extension of infection into your optic nerve. So there can be optic neuritis or there can be retinal artery occlusion or ophthalmic vein occlusion because the orbital pressure is significantly high. So, these things can contribute to visual loss. Okay. So, that is why these findings will happen in an orbital cellulitis or beyond orbital cellulitis classification. When do you suspect this child is having intracranial extension? Like we have always, always discussed. So, when you are having a patient, you will see, you will ask questions to know where the problem is. Why did the problem happen? What is the extent of the problem? Has this problem caused any complication? Okay. So, the complication that you are more worried about is intracranial extension. Correct? Intracranial extension, what can happen? Either it forms an empyma, epidural or a subdural empyma. Or parenchymal brain abscess can happen. Meningitis can happen. Or if it is going and sitting in the cavernous sinus, throm cavernous sinus thrombosis can happen. And at that time, child can have third nerve palsy, fourth nerve, sixth nerve, V1 and V2. See, V1, V2 la. Fifth, fifth cranial nerve ka first segment and second segment. So these pass through the cavernous sinus. So these cranial nerve ka palsies can happen. So any child 
with this eye features of orbital cellulitis you are having headache vomiting focal neurological deficit at any point in time during your examination and after initiation of therapy you will suspect intracranial extension if this child is not responding to therapy you will suspect intracranial extension in addition to um, uh, inadequate source control okay by source control i mean so suppose there is a, a collection that is sitting there in the sinus okay so this child has come you have examined you have noted down that it is orbital cellulitis you do not see signs of any intracranial extension clinically or radiological okay now what investigations will you do cct you have already done and we will assume you will do basic blood test basic blood test can include just cbc crp and electrolyte blood culture is a must though it is rarely positive hardly less than 30% will give a positive blood culture okay the organisms that you expect generally are staphylococcus aureus streptococcus it can be anginosis species it can be pyogen species it can be pneumococcus species but some streptococcus species can be there anaerobes especially if it is a sinus infection it's a mixed organism you may not be able to identify what organism it is and you need to know which specimen to send suppose uh, you are having a sinus collection that is causing orbital cellulitis and your ent surgeon has deemed it necessary that they are going to do a drainage then you send that for your pus culture gram stain or whatever microbiological investigation you want rather than sending one uh, throat swab or uh, some chutuku pus that is coming out of your eye okay so better quality of specimen better yield of organism that is why ct scan we already discussed when we are going to do mri is better especially when you are looking for soft tissue extension but mri may not always be feasible because our patients are younger smaller and the mri needs a longer time and you will have to sedate the patient okay and specimen for culture we already discussed so now that you have sent investigations culture uh, all of that you have done ct you have done now you have to treat the patient it is going to be as inpatient okay so be very clear in that and you needs to be iv antibiotic the choice of antibiotic should cover these three that we discussed okay so it needs to be vancomycin ceftriaxone metronidazole okay how much will you do vancomycin you can do 60 mg per kg per day you can do divided q6 hourly okay loading we generally give 20 mg per kg ceftriaxone you can do 50 mg per kg per dose 12 hourly metronidazole around 10 mg per kg per dose 8 hour okay and remember any abscess any collection that is formed will need drainage okay so you can't treat an abscess just medically you need to drain that abscess only then antibiotics will penetrate duration of treatment is going to be 2 to 3 weeks but are you going to do all of them as iv not really needed so when do you switch you need to look for improvement in the clinical symptom okay so usually after starting antibiotics by 48 hours your fever will start coming down it will start spacing out it will start coming down in degree it will start responding earlier to your um, antipyretics by 72 hours your eye ka symptoms local symptoms will start getting better swelling erythema can start getting better so if these things have started by usually by around 5 days this will show definite signs of improvement then after 5 days you can switch over to oral course oral course can be amoxiclav or cefpodoxim plus linazolid or clindamycin okay so this combination you will need to do and you will need to complete nearly 3 weeks of total course okay not just oral total course of antibiotic and like i said during this course of treatment you always need to look for complications complications you are especially worried about intracranial complication thrombosis in cavernous sinus and direct intracranial infection extension okay all the best